Good morning and welcome to the class. Even though it's a virtual class. This morning we are going to look at neurulation and neurotube defects. Now, neurulation is part of a big picture towards the development of the central nervous system. And so that is why I'm calling it part of development of the central nervous system. So in this particular one, we are not going to look at the whole of the central nervous system. We are just going to look at the process of neurulation and the disorders associated with that are called neurotube defects. We'll also look at them. But before we look at neurulation, let me give you the big picture about development of the central nervous system. The human central nervous system developed in four phases. The first phase is what we call the phase of dorsal induction. And basically that is the phase you're going to talk about when the neurotube forms. But there are other phases. The second phase is called the phase of ventral induction. This is where now the neurotube is being induced to differentiate into different parts. And partially we'll talk about that just to a little extent because we'll talk about derivatives of the neurotube but we'll not look into the details of how ventral induction take place. The third phase of CNS development is a phase of neuronal proliferation and migration. This is when neurons undergo mitosis. We call that neurogenesis, when nerve cells are being formed. During that process, when the nerve cells are being formed, they also migrate from certain regions to another through various migratory patterns. And so we call that neuronal proliferation and migration. And the last phase of CNS development is a phase of myelination. This is when the neurons now acquire the the myelin sheet around them. So those are the four phases of CNS development. In this lecture, we'll only focus on dorsal induction. So what is dorsal induction in simple terms? Dorsal induction is a stage when there is formation of the neurotube. The process of forming the neurotube is what we call neurulation. It occurs by from the third week of development per se by induction of the notochord. Let me say that in a different way. The beginning of neurulation is marked by induction by the notochord. And that happens maybe from the third week up to the fourth week of development, resulting in what we call the primary neurotube, as well as something called the neurocrest. And in this lecture, we are going to see what is neurotube and what is neurocrest. However, that's not the only thing that entails dorsal induction. The most caudal portion of the neurotube undergoes neurulation through a different mechanism. We call that mechanism secondary neurulation. And again, we are going to see how it happens. Now, while primary neurulation takes place 
in the period between the third and the fourth week of development. Secondary neurulation is usually not completed until the second month. Very interesting. So anyway, that is what dorsal induction entail when you talk of the first phase of CNS development. So when you talk of neurulation, I've told you is a process of formation of the neural tube. The neural tube is the embryonic primordium of the central nervous system. And when you talk of central nervous system, we are primarily referring to the brain as well as the spinal cord. The main process, which is primary neurulation, occurs in the third to the fourth week, as I've already told you. But secondary neurulation lags up to the second month. So we are going to describe primary neurulation and we're going to describe secondary neurulation in this particular lecture. The primary neurulation itself is the one that is direct by the notal cord. And we are going to see why the notal cord cannot direct secondary neurulation, but it directs primary neurulation. So having said the many things I have said, perhaps it's the best time to now give you the learning outcome. Our first agenda, would be to talk about how the notochord forms. We are also going to see the functions of the notochord and eventually see the fate of the notochord. After we've done that, we'll then describe the processes of primary as well as secondary neurulation. Now that will give us what we call neurotube and neurocrest. And then we'll then outline the derivatives of the neurotube. In embryology, when you talk of derivatives, it means what does that thing become basically? So we're going to see what neurotube becomes and what neurocrest becomes. Our last agenda will be to define what we call neurotube defects. And we'll cite a few examples of neurotube defects. So straight away, let's begin with the first agenda, which is to look at the notochord. The notochord is a special cartilaginous structure. This special cartilaginous structure lies within the mesoderm layer of the gastrula. I believe you already know what the trilaminar embryo is, or the gastrula, which has three layers, basically. The ectoderm, in this image, it's blue. Mesoderm is that middle layer, and the endoderm is the lower layer, the one that's yellow there. So this notochord lies in the mesoderm layer. It's a special cartilage structure. I want to look at this, the first image. In the third week of development, when the process of gastrulation begins, there's something called the primitive streak. That primitive streak forms from the caudal end of the embryo and it ends somewhere. And the end of the primitive streak is what we call the primitive pit. It is from that point, the primitive pit, that actually the notochord will begin. So this black thing you're seeing is the notochordal process. So that is to tell you that the notochord does not span the whole of the embryo. 
it is only on the cranial end of the embryo. The same way that the primitive streak was only on the caudal end of the embryo. But there's a distinction here. The primitive streak was on the epiblast, the future ectoderm, so to speak. The notochord lies within mesoderm, largely the connective tissue layer of the embryo. So that black thing is an autocrat. And so the image you're seeing down here is perhaps a section at this end here around the there. So you're seeing ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. I want you to notice that the notochord is midline and it is on the cranial end of the gastrula. Having said so, we can replicate that on this particular image of a dorsal view of the gastrula. If that's the cranial end, this is the caudal end. So the primitive streak starts from here in that direction. And then we have the end of the primitive stick there. Then from there, we now have the notochord, except that the notochord now lies within the mesoderm layer as opposed to the ectoderm layer or the epiblast, so to speak. So what are the key functions of the notochord? One of the functions the notochord serves is to provide structural support to the trilaminar embryo. We know that the formation of the notochord begins at around day 17 onwards. This is the time that we now have the trilaminar embryo as opposed to the bilaminar embryo. Remember the trilaminar embryo is the gastrula which forms from day 14 up to day 18 there. That is the period of gastrulation. And so from day 17, we have the notochord and it will form. So it will be providing structural support to the gastrula. Apart from providing structural support to the gastrula, because it is in the midline, the notochord also establishes the embryonic axis. The same way the primitive streak also establishes the embryonic axis. This, the other roles of the notochord, the third role that we can state is that the notochord forms the basis of formation of the axial skeleton. I'm not saying that the notochord is the axial skeleton. What that statement means is that the axial skeleton of the baby will form around the notochord. And remember, when you talk of axial skeleton, you are referring to either the cranium, the vertebral column, where we also have the ribs there. So, in particular, the vertebral column of the baby and the posterior cranium of the baby form around the notochord. So that's why I'm saying it forms the basis for formation of the axial skeleton. It means that wherever the notochord will be, that is where the axial skeleton will be. Last but not least, the notochord induces the process of primary neurulation. Well, there's another function that can be added here, that the notochord is also a source of mesenchymal cells. Mesenchymal cells are embryonic connective tissue cells. Notochord is a source of mesenchymal cells. But I want to remember this for primarily anyway. So you've noted there that notochord induced the primary neurulation process and we'll be shortly talking about primary neurulation. 
So this image here shows you the notochord. That is the notochordal process. And these other structures here, if you remember, they represent the somites, which form on either side of the notochord. Remember, somites are part of paraxial mesoderm, the paired cubes that form on either side of the notochord, we call them somites, but they are part of paraxial mesoderm. Before we leave the story of notochord and talk about new relation itself, perhaps it's important to talk about the fate of the notochord. So this is the fate of the notochord. A big part of the notochord will disappear after the notochord has served its key functions. However, not everything disappears. The parts that don't disappear, the parts of the notochord that don't disappear are some small segments which become incorporated into the developing intervertebral discs of the fetus. I hope you remember what intervertebral discs are. They are joints between adjacent vertebrae. So this is how the vertebrae form. You can see this big thing here called sclerotome. Remember sclerotome is part of the somite. The paraxial mesoderm, okay, let's go back first. Intrambranic mesoderm has three parts, lateral plate mesoderm, intermediate mesoderm, and paraxial mesoderm. Paraxial mesoderm is called so because the mesoderm parallel to the axis, very near the axis. This paraxial mesoderm is the one that forms the cubes. And those cubes are the ones we call somites. The somites differentiate into two key things. This is what we call the sclerotome and the dermomyotome. Then dermomyotome differentiates into dermatome and myotome. Myotome give you skeletal musculature. Dermatom give you the damage to the skin, especially the one on the back. Sclerotome give you the axioskeleton. And one of the components of the axioskeleton is the vertebrae. So this is one sclerotome, that's another sclerotome, that's another sclerotome. Adjacent sclerotomes contribute to formation of the vertebral body as you can see in that image, a dozen sclerotomes contribute to formation of the vertebral body. So usually just half of the sclerotome will be taken to form a vertebral body. And so the gaps between the split parts of the sclerotome will be the one that form the intervertebral discs. And so the notochord within those segments will also contribute to formation of the intervertebral discs. So that the intervertebral discs has two components. The central zone of the intervertebral disc is what we call the nucleus pulposus. And that's the derivative of the notochord. The peripheral aspects of the intervertebral discs are called annulus fibrosus. And these ones are remnants of the sclerotome. So nucleus pulposus is just a, a type of connective tissue. You call it mucus connective tissue. It's in the central part of the intervertebral disc. The outer parts, annulus fibrosus, are derivatives of the sclerotome. You'll say much about that when you look at development of the axial skeleton some other day. So that summarizes for us the fate of the notochord. Sometimes 
the parts of the notochord that are supposed to disappear may fail to disappear. If parts of the notochord that are supposed to disappear fail to disappear, it may give us trouble. The tissues of the notochord may grow into a tumor and that may give you trouble. Now we're going to see that shortly. Okay, there's an image here that shows you the vertebral column. That's the intervertebral disc and that, those are the vertebrae. So that's the nucleus pulposus, that's the annulus fibrosus. Now, this is what I was saying. I ran ahead of myself. Notochord is supposed to disappear. But if some parts that are supposed to disappear fail to disappear, the cells of the notochord may grow into a tumor. Those tumors are called codomas. One unique thing about codomas that they are midline tumors. Commonly found at the base of skull there, within the basilar bone, may also be found in the lower parts of the vertebral column. But importantly, they are midline tumors. All right, so that is the first agenda, the notochord. Our second agenda is to describe the process of primary and secondary neurulation. I want you to look at this image so that we are able to understand what is primary neurulation and what secondary neurulation. This is the embryo. We are looking at the embryo from the top at around the time that the primitive streak has already formed and gastrulation is taking place or has just been completed. So that would mean that this is the caudal end of the embryo, which has the primitive streak coming that way. So where the primitive streak begin, will be the caudal end of the baby and the primitive streak ends somewhere there. It is from the end of the primitive streak that we now have the notochordal process, albeit the fact that it will be running within the mesoderm layer as opposed to be in the ectoderm or epiblast. So this is the notochordal process. So the notochordal process is on the cranial end. Now, if you take a cross section at this point, this is what you see. You see the primitive streak, you don't see the notochord. But if you take a section at this point, that's what you see, you see the notochord because the notochord is only on the cranial end. If you are going to have a neural tube that spans the whole length of the baby, there's no way the notochord is going to help us in forming the neural tube on the caudal end because the notochord is not on the caudal end. It is for that reason, therefore, that we have two types of neurulation. Primary neurulation refers to formation of the neural tube on the cranial part of the baby. And that process relies on notochordal process. Secondary neurulation refers to formation of the neural tube on the caudal end of the baby. And that process does not rely on the notochord. So we are going to see what it relies on, but at least not notochord. Let's begin by talking about primary neurulation. There's a short video I have that I want to play for you. So just listen to it 
so that you have an understanding about how primary neurulation take place. The first event of neurulation is the formation of a thickened area of cells called the neural plate. The neural plate forms at the cranial end of the embryo and grows in a cranial to caudal direction. The cranial or head end of the neural plate indicates the region of the future brain, and the narrower caudal or tail end represents the future region of the spinal cord. By the end of the third week of development, the lateral edges of the neural plate become elevated and move together to form the neural folds. The resulting space created by the folding of the neural plate is called the neural groove. The neural folds fuse together and the neural plate transforms into the neural tube, the precursor to the central nervous system. Fusion of the neural tube usually begins in the middle of the embryo, extending in both cranial and caudal directions. During the closure of the neural tube, cells on the crest of the neural folds detach, forming a new cell population called the neural crest. These cells contribute to the formation of the peripheral nervous system. Once the neural tube has completely fused, the process of neurulation is complete. All right, that's it. Let's see that in a different way. I'll just recap what that video has shown you, but in a different way. So we've noted that the trilaminar embryo has the ectoderm, mesoderm layer, and endoderm. Let's take the blue to be ectoderm and this wider region to be mesodermal region and perhaps that thin line to be the endoderm. We've also noted that the notochord runs within the mesoderm layer in the cranial end of the baby. Look at the location of the notochord and its relationship with the ectoderm. We note that the central parts of the ectoderm are within molecular influence of the notochord. But the peripheral parts of the ectoderm are not within molecular influence of the notochord. The regions of the ectoderm which are within molecular influence of the notochord become induced by the notochord to form what we call neuroectoderm. Well, some people call it neuroepithelium. You can call it neuroectoderm. I want you to note that the notochord induces the central zones of the notochord. So the central zones of the ectoderm the parts of the ectoderm within molecular influence of the notochord. So that becomes the neuroectoderm, perhaps that region. And so the regions away from that, which could be here or there, are not within that molecular influence. We call that the surface ectoderm. So, our ectoderm has now differentiated into two, neuroectoderm and surface ectoderm. Surface ectoderm, if you remember, surface ectoderm will now give you the epidermis of the skin. So that is what it becomes, specifically the keratinocytes within the epidermis of the skin about neuroectoderm. The neuroectoderm thickens. The thickening could be because of cellular proliferation, 
the regions of the ectoderm within molecular influence of the notochord undergo thickening. Could be because of cellular proliferation or even cell migration, but largely cellular proliferation. The thickened neuroectoderm is known as the neuroplate. The next event that takes place is that the neuroplate falls on itself in that manner. And perhaps the lower image is better. So when it falls itself in this manner, the central part is a depression. The depression is called the neural groove. And then we have elevated ages, which we call the neural folds. So this is a neural groove, and that's a neural fold. What happens next is that the neural folds come together so that they fuse. And when the neural folds fuse, they fuse to form a neural tube. From the video, you noted that the fusion process begin from not at one end, but in the middle, although that middle actually corresponds to the region of the neck of the baby. Now, from that middle, which corresponds to the neck of the baby, the neural tube, the neural folds fuse in a cranial direction and caudal direction like a zipper. So it closes in a zipper manner. What you'll have is a tube. Even though the folds fuse to form the tube, not all the cells which were part of the plate, look at that part. See when the folding occurs, this is the part that will be elevated. But the, all of this up to there was part of the neuroectoderm. So what happened? The folds are the ones that will fuse. The ages of the folds will separate from the tube. They break off. The cells of the neuroectoderm that break off from the neural folds are the ones you are calling the neural crests. And so these ones are neural crests. If we say that in a different way using these images, the first event was induction by the notochord. That's the notochord which induces overlying ectoderm to become neuroectoderm. The neuroectoderm thickens to form the neuroplates. And the, well, first of all, we have formation of the neuroectoderm and the surface ectoderm. So, surface ectoderm becomes the epidermis of the skin. Neuroectoderm is what will become the nervous system. The neuroectoderm thickens to form the neuroplate. Then the neural plate falls on itself so that that central region is called the neural groove. And uh, the edges are called the neural folds, or in this one, neural groove and neural folds. The folds come together in a zipper manner so that we form a neural tube, which is there, and neural crest. These images will be better in showing us neural crest. So you have the neural groove there, neural folds. Now we have neural tube and neural crests. This is how the primary neural tube would look like. During closure, it begins around the neck region and close cranially and caudally in a zipper manner. So before the two ends close, those openings are called the neuropores. The cranial neuropore, which is this one, closes around the 25th day. Remember, neurulation process started on day 17 by formation of the notochord. The cranial neuropore closes around the 25th day. <laughs> 
The cardinal neural pore, which is this one, usually close about three days later. Well, two to three days later. Right, that is a primary neural tube. And so primary neurulation is complete by the end of the fourth week. What about secondary neurulation? Secondary neurulation is not neurulation by notochordal induction, but it is neurulation by mesenchymal condensation. Maybe some terminologies to understand. Mesenchyme is embryonic connective tissue. And it is the one that is largely within the mesoderm layer. So the mesoderm, when it differentiates differentiate to mesenchyme, then those embryonic connective tissues can now give you many other things. This mesenchymal condensation occurs in the caudal ends of the baby to contribute to formation of the caudal neural tube. Remember the caudal end of the baby does not have a notochord and therefore the ectoderm cannot be induced to thicken to form the neural plate. That is why secondary neurulation is important because in those caudal ends, we don't have a neural plate because there's no notochord. But we still need a neural tube. This is how it happens. Okay, this image shows you the cranial end which contain notochord. So this one neurulation can occur by formation of the neural plate first because you have a notochord. But the neural tube on this end cannot develop through the process of notochordal induction because you don't have notochord there. So what happened? This is what happens. If you had to take a cross section at this end, this is what we see. We have the ectoderm there. We have mesoderm or mesenchyme, and we have notochord. Sorry, we have endoderm. I'll say that again. Ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. You notice that we don't have a notochord at this point. So the first step is that the mesoderm or the mesenchymal cells within mesoderm undergo condensation. And that is what we see there, condensation of mesenchymal cells. That condensation again could be because of neuronal migration or other cellular migration and also cellular proliferation. Maybe this one now shows us a clear picture of how that condensation has actually taken place. That condensed region of the mesenchymal cells is a linear structure as opposed to a dot like this. Remember this is just a cross-section but I want to imagine it's spanning the whole of that length. So it's a linear structure. That linear structure is called the neural rod. Neural rod. So there is formation of the neural rod. Now, if you remember your lecture on epithelial tissues, you are told that epithelial cells are cohesive. They are compacted, they are closely packed. They hold to one another. That's actually a bit different from connective tissue cells, which tend to scatter. They don't hold so strong to one another. So what do we notice here? That in the formation of the secondary neural tube, cells which were originally scattered acquire properties of just being close together. That concept is called mesenchymal epithelial transition. 
the cells which undergo secondary neurulation undergo the process of mesenchymal epithelial transition. They transit from mesenchymal characteristics, scattered migratory, to epithelial characteristics, cohesive, compacted. And so when we have the neural road, the cells there have actually already undergone mesenchymal epithelial transition. Don't confuse with epithelial mesenchymal transition, which we see in other cells. In, but in this case, we are seeing mesenchymal epithelial transition. The next thing after formation of the neural road is that the central part of the neural road undergo cavitation. Cavitation here simply means that the cells at the center of the neural road die through the process of apoptosis. And so a cavity forms at the center of the neural road. Eventually, we have something that looks like that, which you now call the secondary neural tube. So that is how secondary neurulation takes place. Once the neural tube has formed through primary neurulation for the cranial end of the neural tube and secondary neurulation for the caudal end of the neural tube. Let's see that in the first image here. So assume this is the primary neural tube. This is the cranial end, that's the caudal end of the primary neural tube. And that is perhaps the secondary neural tube developing now here developed. So that's the secondary neural tube is the primary neural tube. The two neural tubes fuse together. The process of fusion of the primary and the secondary neural tube has a name as well. We call it junctional neurulation. Junctional neurulation is a process of fusion of the primary neural tube and the secondary neural tube. We call it junctional neurulation. And so after junctional neurulation, we have one long neural tube. The cranial end ha having come from primary neural tube and the caudal end having come from secondary neural tube. So these images show you the process of junctional neurulation. Uh, the cranial end of the tube from primary neural tube, primary neurulation, caudal end from secondary neural tube, the junction there, the fusion will be through junctional neurulation. All right, so that is how primary neurulation and secondary neurulation take place the junction between the two, junction and relation. I forgot to tell you, but not late, that the junction between the primary and the secondary neural tube is actually somewhere in the sacral segments of the spinal cord. All right, so that's our second agenda done. Our third agenda is to look at the derivatives of neural tube as well as derivatives of the neural crest. Before we look at the derivatives of the neural tube and neural crest, perhaps it's important that we familiarize with the parts of the neural tube in terms of cross section. So immediately the neural tube is formed it will be looking like this. We can see that uh, the wall is made up of compacted cells. Remember, epithelial. And that is why some people call it neuroepithelium as opposed to surface epithelium. 
but we also have cells of the neural crest, which came from primary neurulation, which have freed themselves. We'll be saying something about that shortly. As time goes by, as time goes by, we have the layer, the wall of the neural tube. We have the wall of the neural tube increasing in thickness. And so cells within the wall of the neural tube starting to migrate to form some zones that I want to name in the next slide. Look at it this way as well. So that is the neural tube that is forming just before closure. The wall is very thick. It's epithelium. The neuroepithelium is largely a pseudostratified columna epithelium at the beginning. And remember when you say pseudostratified columna, it means that you basically have a mixture of short and tall cells, but all of them rest on the basement membrane. Beyond that pseudostratified columnar epithelium, there'll be now some zonations later. It will eventually be actually stratified. The types of cells which are within the neuroepithelium at this point differentiate into two. There are those ones that become neuroblasts. Neuroblasts are the ones designated to become the neurons. Remember, those are the functional cells of the nervous tissue. Then you have the glioblasts. Glioblasts are the cells designated to become the supporting cells of the nervous tissue, what we call neuroglia. So at this point, they are present, both of them, in this particular epithelium. There's a population of gliocells that differentiate very early we call them the radial glial cells. The radial glial cells differentiate very early from this particular epithelium. And those radial glial cells are important in subsequent migration of the neurons. So this image captures that concept I've told you. Consider this to be the wall of the neural tube. And within that wall, you have stratified epithelium. Within that stratified epithelium, you have radioglial cells. The radioglial cells form a scaffold that now neurons will follow later as they migrate. So they guide neuronal migration. So as the neurons migrate, the wall of the neural tube continues to become thicker and thicker. And as the wall of the neural tube becomes thicker and thicker, the lumen of the neural tube, therefore, will narrow. Later, the wall of the neural tube differentiates into three zones. The innermost zone, this thick one here, is called the ventricular zone or the ependymal zone. The ventricular zone contains the stem cells of neuroblasts and glioblasts. So it's a stem cell zone. It is from here that cells migrate away. Apart from that, the ventricular zone will eventually become the ependymal lining of the central nervous system. Maybe those terminologies may not be very clear with you if you don't know much about the cells of the nervous system. 
but ependymal lining of the nervous system refer to the cell layer that line the cavities that contain cerebrospinal fluid. So that is the ventricular zone. Then you have the mantle zone. The mantle zone is this region here. You can call it the intermediate zone. The mantle zone contains cell bodies of neurons. So the ones that are migrated from here, they go there. The cell bodies of neurons will now stay there. The, the neurons which have already differentiated, their cell bodies lie within the mantle zone. In future, the mantle zone will form the gray matter of the central nervous system. The outermost zone is called the marginal zone or the peripheral zone. The marginal zone referred to the layer of the neurotube that contain axons of neurons. This is the layer that will become the white matter of the central nervous system. So we have ventricular zone, mantle zone, and marginal zone. Maybe in this image, we capture that again. The marginal zone, sorry, the ventricular zone there, which is also called the pendymo zone, or you can call it germinal zone. The reason why it's called germinal zone is because it's contained the stem cells. Then mantle zone and uh, peripheral zone, also called marginal zone. Look at what happens to the mantle zone. The mantle zone of the neurotube forms some cube-like swellings, two pairs. One pair ventrally and one pair dorsally. Let's give names to those pairs in the next slide. So in this next slide, we see if this is the ventricular zone, this colorful region here is the mantle zone and this is the marginal zone. So the marginal zone is a peripheral zone giving you white matter that's where axons of neurons will lie. This is ventricular zone, which originally contained the stem cells, now remaining as the ependymal lining of the central nervous system. The middle zone, the intermediate zone, which we call the mantle zone, has differentiated into two pairs of cubes. The ventral pair of cubes is called the basal plate. <clears throat> the basal plate give rise to motor neurons, which arise from the central nervous system. Motor neurons, efferent neurons, arising from the central nervous system to go to the peripheral nervous system. So we can say that the basal plate represents the motor column of the central nervous system. The dorsal pair of cubes is what we call the ala plate. The ala plate represents the sensory column. It receives sensory nerves which enter the CNS. The junction between the motor column and the sensory column here is known as the sulcus limitans. Salka's limitants, the junction between sensory column and the motor column. The roof plate is a junction between the right and the left ala plate. While the floor plate is a junction between the right and the left basal plate. Those are the parts of the neurotube in cross-section. <clears throat> 
So the whole neural tube, what does it become? The image here shows you the primary neural tube, but let's assume it was the whole neural tube. What does it become? The cranial two thirds of the neural tube, which means from somewhere there all the way to somewhere there. Cranial two thirds. The cranial two thirds of the neural tube give you the brain. The caudal one third of the neural tube is the one that gives you the spinal cord. Now, don't confuse and start arguing the spinal cord is very long, so it should take the longer length. That might sound logical, but not quite because we are looking at the mass of the tissue being formed per se, rather than the length of the tissue being formed. So the cranial two thirds of the neural tube become the central nerve, sorry, become the brain. While the caudal one third of the neural tube become the spinal cord. So you will be wondering then there was primary neurulation and secondary neurulation. It means that the secondary neural tube contribute to the lowermost end of the spinal cord, largely the sacral spinal cord, while the rest of the spinal cord, cervical segment, thoracic segment, lumbar segment, and even sacral one largely come from the primary neural tube. So what come from the secondary neural tube will be more of S3 downwards. S2 is the region of the junction of neurulation. The part of the neural tube that becomes a brain, what happens to it? The part of the neural, neural tube that becomes a brain develops three swellings. And these swellings now will be now under what we call ventral induction. If you remember the second phase of CNS development, ventral induction. The cranial two thirds of the neural tube undergo ventral induction to form three swellings. We have the forebrain swelling, midbrain swelling, and the hindbrain swelling, and they'll give us those things. So forebrain swelling will give you the forebrain, midbrain swelling gives midbrain, and hindbrain swelling gives the hindbrain. Forebrain is called prosencephalon, and that's what refers to the cerebrum in particular. Rhombencephalon is the hindbrain, and that refers to cerebellum, pons, and medal oblongata. You'll talk about that more when you look at development of the central nervous system as an organ per se, developing the brain itself. So for now, we can leave it there that the cranial part of the neural tube give you the brain, which has three swellings, forebrain swelling, midbrain swelling, and hindbrain swelling. Usually the wall of the tube is what will give the brain tissue and the cavity of the tube will give you the ventricular pathway or a CSF pathway, so to speak. How about neural crest derivatives? Before we talk about derivatives of neural crest, it is important that you realize some characteristics of neural crest. Remember, they were neuroepithelial cells, which means they were cohesive cells attached to one another. But when primary neurulation took place, they broke off from the neural folds. So the edges of the neural plate broke off. That act of breaking off tell us something about neural crest. It means they lose their characteristics of being cohesive or compacted 
to now being scattered. Neurocrest cells undergo epithelial mesenchymal transition. So this is the opposite of what happened in secondary neurulation, which is mesenchymal epithelial transition. The neurocrest cells undergo epithelial mesenchymal transition. And having undergone that transition, neurocrest cells are now having some properties. One of them is that they're migratory. It means they can move a lot, they migrate a lot. And second property is that they're multipotent cells. What does that mean? It means that they have the capacity of becoming multiple tissue lines, as you're going to see here. So neurocrest cells give you many things. In the peripheral nervous system, neurocrest gives you a lot of things. We can name a few. To give you the Schwann cells of the peripheral nervous system, these are the cells that form the myelin sheath around neurons. It will give you satellite cells within the peripheral nervous system. These are the cells that surround cell bodies of neurons in the peripheral nervous system. It will give you the pseudonipolar neurons, which are sensory neurons, basically. So sensory nerves, like those sensory nerves you, you might be already knowing in the body, they come from neurocrest cells. It also gives you what you call postganglionic autonomic neurons. Postganglionic autonomic neurons. Maybe a concept you need to understand about autonomic nervous system is that the peripheral processes for, for autonomic nerves are two. There's the preganglionic and the postganglionic neuron. The preganglionic neuron arises from the central nervous system. So that one will be a derivative of the basal plate of the neural tube because it's motor but the postganglionic autonomic neuron is entirely outside the central nervous system. That one comes from neurocrest. It could be postganglionic sympathetic neurons or postganglionic parasympathetic neurons. Apart from that, having said so, it therefore means that neurocrest also gives us what we call autonomic ganglia. Autonomic ganglia refer to collections of cell bodies of the postganglionic neurons. That's what you call autonomic ganglia. They could be parasympathetic or they could be sympathetic. But those ganglia come from neurocrests. Apart from that, the ganglia of sympathetic nervous system tend to form tend to be interconnected on either side of the vertebral column to form what we call the sympathetic chain. So that sympathetic chain is also a neurocrest derivative. Some cells of the neurocrest migrate into the wall of the digestive system to form a nerve plexus around the wall of the digestive system. That nerve plexus around the wall of the digestive system is what we call the enteric nervous system. There are two plexuses there. One beneath the epithelium, just called submucosal nerve plexus, and one within muscular layer called my enteric nerve plexus. The two of them are components of enteric nervous system, and they also come from neurocrest. All those are derivatives of neurocrest cells within the peripheral nervous system. Then we have derivatives of neurocrest cells within the skin. So what does neurocrest give us within the skin? Neurocrest give us the pigment cells of the skin. We call them the melanocytes. These are the pigment cells of the skin melanocytes. Apart from that, neurocrest also give us the Merkel cells of the skin, M 
E R K E L Merkel cells of the skin. These cells are tactile receptor cells in the skin. And of course, the sensory nerves within the skin also come from neurocrest. That's okay. In the endocrine system, what does neurocrest give us? Neurocrest cells give us the chromaffin cells. These chromaffin cells are the ones which produce the adrenaline hormone. So they are adrenaline secreting cells. Where are they found? They are found in the central part of the adrenal gland. And that central part of the adrenal gland is what you call the adrenal medulla. Don't confuse with the adrenal cortex. The adrenal cortex does not arise from neural crest. Adrenal cortex produces steroid hormones. It arises from the epithelium that surround the interembryonic ceylon, arises from ceylonic epithelium, that region there. But adrenomedala, the cells of adrenomedala, chromaffin cells, those ones are neurocrest cells. They secrete adrenaline hormone or basically catecholamines. Apart from chromaffin cells, we also have the parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland. Parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland are calcitonin secreting cells of the thyroid gland. So they're found within the thyroid gland. They secrete calcitonin hormone. Those are the derivatives of neurocrest cells within the endocrine system. How about in the craniofacial region? Many things as well. Generally, the neurocrest within the craniofacial region give us many things. Gives you the epithelium of the iris, you can call that iridal epithelium. If you extrapolate that, remember those are pigment cells as well. It also gives you the cells that form teeth. We call them odontoblasts. But let me put it this way. The neural crest that goes to the craniofacial region contribute to formation of mesenchyme of the craniofacial region. Remember, mesenchyme is embryonic connective tissue. So the neural crest that goes to the craniofacial region contribute to formation of mesenchyme of the craniofacial region. The mesenchyme of neural crest origin give you the following the facial skeleton. So the bones of the face as opposed to the posterior cranium. The posterior cranium is a derivative of the paraxial mesoderm. But the anterior cranium, the facial cranium is a derivative of neural crest. So the bones of the face are of neural crest origin. They come from mesenchyme of neural crest origin. The dummies of the skin of the face is also of neural crest origin. The, what we call leptomeninges. Leptomeninges refer to arachnoid matter and pia matter. Arachnoid matter and pia matter are also of neural crest origin. They're still in the craniofacial region. Lastly, well, there are other things that neural crest of the craniofacial region will give you. And you can check on them though. In the heart, neural crest has a role. It doesn't give you the heart per se, but basically it is responsible for cardiac septation. The splitting of the heart into chambers and especially the splitting of this embryonic structure that give you what we call the aorta, ascending aorta, and the pulmonary trunk. Initially, those two vessels are one. The vessel arising from the right ventricle, pulmonary trunk, and the one arising from the left ventricle, aorta. 
initially it's one channel. Then the cells of needle crest contribute to the septation of that region so that we have those two vessels separate. Okay, so in this image here, I think you can still see that. Now this classification of neural crest, I find it a bit confusing and I don't like it so much because this classification does not tell us where those neural crests are going, but basically where they are at the beginning. And can be very confusing because we've already agreed that neural crest cells are migratory. So I'd rather you focus on this column and understand the derivatives of neural crest. As opposed to you focusing here, then you get lost. In the craniofacial region, this slide will show you the derivatives of neural crest in the craniofacial region, the ones that I didn't talk about. All right, that was the third agenda, derivatives of neurotube and neurocrest. The last part of the lecture will focus on neurotube effects. We'll define what they are and we'll cite some examples of neurotube defects. Neurotube defects are basically significant but deformities of the central nervous system, which occur as a result of abnormal neurulation process. And predominantly, the events that took place during primary neurulation. Now, they develop when a portion of the neurotube failed to close normally during the process of neurulation. So if there's a portion of the neurotube that has not closed appropriately, we may have a neurotube defect. However, the malformation that we see does not just limit itself to the neural axis. The malformation that we see involves the axial skeleton which means can involve the vertebral column or the cranium. But yes, they also involve the neural axis. They also involve the other components around there. So think about them, the skin, the adipose tissue around, the musculature around, and especially if you think about the vertebral column, there are some muscles around there. They're all affected. The risk factors for development of neurotube defects would be usually associated folic acid deficiency. There are some genetic factors that have also been noted to contribute. If the temperature of the mother was very high at the time of neurulation, that may also affect. Mothers who are diabetic and those who are obese are also at high risk. I want you to understand that this is just risk factors. It's like saying smoking is a risk factor for development of lung cancer. It doesn't say if you smoke, you'll definitely get lung cancer. And it doesn't say if you don't smoke, you can never get lung cancer. However, if you are to look at 100 smokers and you look at 100 non-smokers and follow them up and look at the occurrence of lung cancer in those two groups, the people who have smoked, there'll be more cases of lung cancer in that cohort compared to the people who are non-smokers. So that's how we want to understand risk factors. 
So in this case, folic acid deficiency is a risk factor for development of neurotic defect. It means that mothers who are lacking in folic acid are at a higher risk of delivering a child with a neurotic defect compared to mothers who don't have folic acid deficiency. But there's a challenge then. And the challenge is this. Neurulation takes place from day 17 onwards following conception. That time, a woman does not even know that she has already conceived. Maybe she's saying the, the periods are delayed, but maybe she's still hopeful. So you've not made a diagnosis of pregnancy yet, yet neurulation is taking place. So it means that's very hard to know that the time of neurulation so that we supplement folic acid. So this is what we do in practice. If a mother delivers a child with folic acid, sorry, if a mother delivers a child with neurotube defect, to prevent that from taking place, because now if that happened, possibly she has folic acid deficiency. To prevent this from taking place in future pregnancies, you must supplement folic acid to that particular woman. But when is the best time to supplement that folic acid? Before that woman conceives. Because if you wait until you diagnose pregnancy, neurulation process is already over and you'll not have helped much. Well, they're still given folic acid either way because folic acid is still important for the rest of neurodevelopment, not just neurulation. Remember, we've just talked about dorsal induction, phase one of development of the central nervous system. But even the rest of development of CNS still require folic acid. And that is why pregnant women are still given folic acid even throughout pregnancy. Great, so I want you to capture the risk factors for development of neurotube defects. We classify neurotube defects into two based on whether the skin covering over the defect. So the ones with skin covering are known as closed neurotube defects. And the ones which lack skin covering are known as open neurotube defects. The ones that we are calling open neurotube defects could be actually covered by thin membrane, which is not skin, or nothing at all. We still call them open neurotube defects. We can also classify neurotube defects depending on where, where they occur. The ones involving the spinal cord will affect the vertebral column. We call them spinal dysraphisms. And spina bifida is an example of spinal dysraphism. The ones affecting the brain involve the skull, we call them the cranial defects. And I'll give you examples of both. Let's start with the spinal dysraphisms. So look at this image here. We see a vertebral column that has not fully closed. This is one of the neurotube defects. This is classically what we call spina bifida. When the vertebral column has not closed fully around the spinal cord. Now, why do we call it spina bifida? Remember, in a normal scenario, you should have the body pedicle there, lamina, then spinous process. And so, if you put your finger from the back of this person, you'll be feeling the spinous process at the center there in a normal scenario. At any horizontal line, you feel one spinous process. But in this particular baby, if you put your finger in one horizontal plane, you'll feel two processes. 
the spine is bifid. It may look like this. There's no swelling. Just a dimple, usually hyperpigmented and may have more hair. There are some molecular reasons for that. That type of spina bifida is what we call spina bifida occulta. The term occulta means hidden occult. Then you may have this scenario where there is a swelling. Commonly, this would be called cystica, but that is not very diagnostic. We want to know more. So we prefer using some terminologies. If there's a swelling, you want to know what is inside the swelling. If it contain meninges with cerebrospinal fluid only, then we call it meninges cell. So it's just a cavity containing fluid and closed by meninges. That is meninges cell. But if the cavity contain CSF and neuro tissue. It doesn't have to be the whole spinal cord like drone here, but neuro tissue. Then we call it meningomyelocil or you can call it myango meningocil. The myelo there refers to neuronal tissue and meningo for the meninges. Seal means uh, assist with fluid inside. Okay, this is still spinal dysraphism, you see that. So this is what I was telling you as normal. In a normal situation, you should just feel that spinous process there. But when you have bifida, you now feel two, as you can see there and there and there. These other ones also have swellings. Sometimes the neural tube may fail to close completely so that you have a neural plate. An open neural plate may be plain like that or may be folded like that. If this open neural plate occurs on just a small segment of the vertebral column, it may have look like that. And that is what we call rachis chesis. The term rachi, the first five letters there, refer to the vertebral column, the spine. Then the other six letters there, stasis, mean open or split. So split spine, rachi stasis. It may involve the whole of the neural axis, that the neural plate is persistent in the whole of the neural axis. So both cranium as well as spine. And that is what we call cranial rachis perhaps one of the most severe forms of neurotube defects. There are some scenarios where the spinal cord itself may be split into two, something splitting it into two. So there's a bone that goes through to split it into two. As you can see in this axial images of the vertebral column or in that sagittal image of the vertebral column, something splitting the spinal cord into two we call that dastematomelia, split spinal cord. So those were spinal dystrophisms. Now let's talk about the cranial defects. Remember there are neurotic defects still, there are disorders of dorsal induction. And we agreed dorsal induction is neurulation. So basically, there are disorders of neurulation. One of them, the one shown here is called anencephaly. 
This occurs following complete failure of closure of the cranial neural pore. So if the cranial neural pore fails to close completely, we get this one, which we call an encephaly. It may simply mean absence of the brain, but uh, in actual sense, the part of the brain that is lacking is largely the forebrain. The brain stem is still intact. Remember, forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. So usually the hindbrain will still be there, but the forebrain is the one's lacking. But we still call it an encephaly. This one is not compatible with postnatal life. So these babies cannot survive postnatally. These images show you images of uh, babies with an encephaly. The brain has not developed, and especially the forebrain, so we can see just the hindbrain is intact. Now, usually when the brain does not develop, it may also affect the skull. So here, even the skull is missing, as you can see. Apart from an encephaly, we also have what we call cephalocils. Cephalocils are similar to meningocils that we just talked about when we talk about spinal dysraphism. There are less severe disorders and uh, they include what we call meningocil that I've just told you and what we call encephalocil. So what are they? They are protrusions of meninges and that is what we call meningocil or protrusion of brain tissue and that's what we call encephalocil through a congenital defect on the skull and dura mater. So there's a defect on the skull, you know, the same way if there was a defect on the vertebral column, meninges would protrude and you call that meningocil in the, in the spina bifida. So consider a similar scenario for spina bifida, but now for the skull, there's a defect in the skull. Through that defect, meningeal tissue protrude, of course, with, with CSF, we call that meningeal cell. Or brain tissue also protrudes, and we call that encephalocell. So those are cephalocells. They are milder compared to an encephaly. This is how they look like. We name cephalocells according to their location. So like this one, it's in the occipital region. You'll call it occipital encephalocell. This one is in the frontal nasal region. So we call this frontal nasal encephalocell. That is still frontal nasal encephalocell to just show you that yes, the brain tissue is also within that particular swelling. This dark region is the fluid. So if this one was present and this one was not there, we'd have called it meningocell. But because the brain tissue has also protruded, we call that encephalocell. These are still encephalocells. Brain tissue is protruding and that is the CSF space. This one is still encephalocell. So those two are occipital encephalocells. Look at this one. This one is protruding through a bone here. Maybe you don't know that bone yet. That's the sphenoid bone. And we don't see brain tissue. We're just seeing fluid. This one is the same as that. So this is meningeal cell. And it is sphenoidal meningeal cell. It's because of the sphenoid bone. Okay, apart from cephalocytes, we also have what you call carry two malformations. 
what are carry to malformations. These are intracranial manifestations of posterior dystrophic defects. What I mean is this. Some things have happened in the neural axis. We have dystrophism. There is spinal dystrophism. If you have spinal dystrophism, it may cause the brain to undergo some malformations. So there are intracranial mal manifestations of the spinal dystrophisms, if you understand what I mean. For example, let me just put this easily. Usually, the spinal cord will grow slowly compared to the way the brain grows, sorry, compared to the way the vertebral column grows in terms of elongation. So even though the spinal cord and the vertebral column are of the same length at the beginning, the spinal cord grows slowly, it lengthens slowly. And so the implication is this, that now the vertebral column will be longer than the spinal cord. That means that the spinal cord will be appearing to shorten. And that is why in adults, it will be terminating at the junction between the lumbar one and lumbar two vertebrae. Although at the beginning, the spinal cord and the vertebral column are of the same length. Now, that's normal. The spinal cord should shorten because the vertebral column will grow faster. Suppose there is spinal dysrhythm that hold the spinal cord down. It means that that spinal cord cannot shorten. So what will happen is that now the spinal cord will be fixed down. The implication here is that now the brain will be pulled down through the vertebral column, as you can see in that image. So carry two malformations are just intracranial manifestations of the dysrhythm that have occurred. And so these are just suffering. There are many manifestations that can be seen, but the hallmark of them is largely the posterior cranial fossa where we see some parts of the brainstem and the cerebellum herniating through the foramen magnum. That becomes very classical. When you see herniation of the brainstem and cerebellum through foramen magnum, it tells you that you're thinking about a carry malformation. If it's a congenital defect, if it's not something due to an accident, So there are many manifestations of carry malformations. I think, I think the other image was better for you. Although for me, I prefer the MRI images because those are the ones that are diagnostic, but that leave to us. I think the other image is okay. Just in case we give you such an image before, or rather later, you look at the location of foramen magnum and look at the cerebellums. If some part of it is extending down, you know you have a carry malformation. You look at the brain stem, if it is appearing so thinned out and it is extending all the way to the spinal canal, that's a carry malformation. All right, now let's talk about malformations associated with neurocrest cells as we finish. So neurocrest cells, we agree that they're migratory, which means they migrate a lot. And we agree that they should migrate and go to the wall of the digestive system so that they can give rise to enteric nervous system. Sometimes neurocrest cells don't do that. And so there are segments of the digestive system that lack neurocrest cells. If you have segments of the digestive system that lack neurocrest cells, those segments are unlikely to experience normal physiology of contraction. Now, think about it this way. Assume that the migration process is from the cranial end towards the caudal end, or in simple terms, from the esophagus going all the way to the rectum. 
if there is a problem with migration, most likely the rectum will be affected more than the esophagus. And so these malformations of migration will largely affect the rectum. Think of a scenario where the rectum does not have nerves. So it means that this person, there are no contractions in the rectum. When this child eats, food cannot go down through the rectum. What will happen is that the colon will balloon out. And that is what you call megacolon. We call it a ganglionic because there's a segment that lack ganglion, cell bodies of neurons. So congenital aganglionic megacolon is also called Hirschsprung's disease. Hirschsprung's disease presents with abdominal distension and the baby fails to pass through. There are some disorders of skin pigmentation because we have agreed that neuroclear cells migrate to the skin to give you melanocytes. So you can have disorders of skin pigmentation. I want you to check on them later and see which disorders of skin pigmentation are due to neuroclast migration. You may also have what we call fast pharyngeal arc syndromes. These are due to deficiency of neuroclast, hence mesenchyme, in the craniofacial region. Again, it's a syndrome. It affects many structures. Hallmark is a mandible and the bones of the ear affected, become small. And some malformations in the heart are also due to neurocrest, especially the ones that are due to separation of the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. We call them conotrancal malformations. I'm trying to avoid going into the details of each of these malformations because we'll talk about them again in each system that they are going to apply. Like the first one you'll talk about in the digestive system, second one you'll look at skin, the third one you'll look at head and neck development, and the fourth one you're looking at cardiovascular development. So this just to make you salivate that neurocrest has a role in those systems and there's some malformations due to neurocrest in those particular systems. Great, so that would be it, I think, yes. We'll stop there. I hope you've now understood what is neurulation and you now know what are neurotube effects. <laughs>